Hello. Welcome to the weekly roundup of the proceedings of the TRRC. Um, this is the second tranche of the testimonies of the week of the 25th. Remember that week we had um, nine witnesses. So last week we dealt with five of the testimonies and today we'll deal with the other four, um, two of whom are, are widows of victims of November 11th. And the other two, well, one of them is still serving in, in the army, but the other one, I think, is now retired. He was an orderly to Yanko Bature. And quite intriguingly, both of them would give testimonies on exactly the same episode, the same event, yet their testimonies couldn't have been more diametrically opposed. Quite, quite intriguing, as, 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 as we said. My name is Mabu um, I'm joined again by my usual suspects, Babu Karsise and Ansumane Eso Nyasi. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thank you, sir. So, the second tranche, we, we dealt with the first one. So the second one, we had more um, widows. The, f the, the first witness that testified was in it. Um, for this one was um, Mati, Mati Sala. Mati Sala. Yes. She was born in 1971 and was married um, to, was, was, was married to Abdullah Ba. Mm -hmm. One of the, we've been hearing Abdullah Ba a lot <laughs> over time. So, so, so t tell us more. Tell us more about Mati's uh, um, testimony. Mati, Mati is um, the woman who was married to the late Lieutenant Abdullah Ba, who uh, unfortunately is one of the uh, victims of the November 11 incident. And uh, she married the late Lieutenant in February 1992. And uh, they were living, you know, she said, uh, in, at, at the barracks. But then it was on the 10th of November where it all began, um, when he informed her that he is going to Yundum Barracks, where he is uh, going to be on duties for the entire night and won't return until the following day. And then it was when um, she woke up the following morning that she received this news that he had, you know, people talking about that there, there was, I mean, shootouts at the barracks, you know, and then she tried to find out what was happening. Um, so because she was concerned and the husband did return, knowing that he had told her, I mean, the night before that he would be spending the night at the barracks and you know getting rumors you know here and there of course details at the time were quite sketchy but then you know because he was concerned you know that her husband was at the barracks i mean uh, presumably was at the barracks um she said she went out but, but, but even before then mm -hmm. on the 10th didn't didn't he go to was it near Makunku? to see their child. Remember, the child was born on the 10th of November. Yes, That was yes. his first birthday. Yes. Um, uh, she said, actually, um, he had told her that he would pass by Nima Kungu, which uh, she understands, I mean, she heard from uh, other relatives that he really did go there before going to uh, the barracks. And then she said um, she went out, went to a nearby booth, telephone booth, this gum tell, you know, booth that we had at the time. And she called to find out where he was. When she called the office, I mean, someone picked, and then um, when she asked, you know, that she wanted to speak to Lieutenant Ba, the person on the other side of the phone said to her, well, um, he's busy right now, you cannot access him, maybe you call back later. And then she said, she went home, but, you know, she wasn't comfortable, she came back again a second time, I mean, called again, you know, someone else picked, you know, and then she said, the second person she spoke to was quite aggressive. And was like, you know what, don't call here again. He's busy. You know, he'll talk to you when it's done. So he said it went on like that until at night. And two soldiers came to the house to, and they said to her that um, the left had asked us to come and collect his ceremonial uniform. Because remember, they were preparing for the uh, Remembrance Day celebration. So she was worried. But then scheduled she, for Sunday. Yes, scheduled for Sunday. Um, so she asked them and said, Where, where's my husband? But then um, they didn't you know, give her any, they didn't say anything anyway. So they left until um, the following day, she said she took it upon herself to go to the barracks to find out, you know, what is really happening or, the, you know, to know if her husband was in any way safe. Uh, when she went there, she said she met, you know, a group of soldiers outside and she, you know, was actually ushered out to the back gate by one of the uh, officers who were posted at the gate. and. She, uh, he had warned her seriously that she shouldn't come there again. I mean, because yeah. she, she, she tried to sneak in. She sneak because in, apparently yes. there was a vehicle that was, that was going out. Mm -hmm. Then when they opened the gate, she tried she to tried sneak, to sneak in. in. Yes. That was when the, 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 the sentry, the, the soldier sentry, exactly. said to her, if you, if you want peace, mm -hmm. if you want your life, just go. 
wasn't it? Sure. Yeah. So um, she said she went home, and the following day, I mean, a group of soldiers came there. She said she was cooking outside, you know, behind. That's where her kitchen is. And then um, left on, late left on a bus, nephew, who was staying with them at the time, niece rather, um, you know, called her and said, you know, uh, there, there are men in uniform entering your, your, your house. And then she said, once she came out of the kitchen, you know, she met with them because they were also coming out at the time. It's like they were, you know, trying to search, looking for things. What, whatever they were looking for, she, she cannot tell anyway. She said, then she asked them, where is my husband, you know, and who sent you here? But, you know, no they, they, they didn't say anything. Yes. And then how did things unfold from then on? Well, um, she said they, you know, from there, they, they, I mean, his disappearance actually has had a serious impact on the family, you know, negatively, of course, um, because they were struggling to make ends meet. And, you know, in fact, I remember her saying that um, her in-law, who, you know, is uh, the late lieutenant's mother, was depressed, you know, really, and it, 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 in the end, you know, she, she, she died. She, she and couldn't survive. Yeah, she and couldn't survive she, it. she lived on hope, didn't she? Yeah. She kept believing. Sure. That her, her, her son sooner or later would return, yeah. but he never did. The mother was still with the belief that one day my, my son will return. But until she died. But obviously, until she died, until she died you know, yeah. the son never returned. Because same the with the father as well. Sure. Apparently, yeah. same with the father. Until he died. Yeah. They, they were yeah. all holding out hope that sure. possibly one day the, 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 the son would return. The, the, the what, is, what is interesting as well is that um, all the friends that, that she knew, you know, Abdullah's friends, mm -hmm. all, all of them, nobody would talk. They all became reticent. This was, this was quite interesting. So it was an information blackout. They, they had you know, no way of getting the yeah, information. Yeah, the lady um, enjoyed a lot trying to find out what actually happened to her husband. And she's very brave working in an army camp. Although I believe she must hear um, rumors that probably the husband has died, but she, she may not be sure about it. But in her bravery um, going into the camp, to find out what has actually happened, and uh, has actually shown the tenacity this woman um, and, and other women have gone through to find out what actually happened um, to their loved ones. But for her, uh, during her testimony, what's the most important, uh, one of the parts I found interesting was um, something I'll call pathetic fallacy, you know, like the son. They said when, when he went to visit the son, a uh, one-year-old son, and then as he was going, the son, the son clinged to his foot and was crying. And we've seen that uh, in a lot of them, like uh, one of them at the army camp before he left, he held the son and he was holding him before he handed it over and he went. So it was that far. Yeah, that far, far exactly. When he held yeah, child, so we've very seen very this thing yeah. as if they knew this would be the end of it, you know. So I call that pathetic fallacy. Things happen in that <laughs> you can't actually explain. Well, in, in these situations, then we, we, we reach to any sort of occult you know, force to, 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 to help and in, in, in many ways is how we interpret mm -hmm. in many of our experiences yeah. through, through um, 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 this lens, don't we? Um, and the uncle as well, the uncle went to see Sana Sabali, didn't he? To find out. Yes. And he was humiliated. Sure, sure. Uh, um, you know, uh, in fact, not just that, I remember her also saying that um, s some of, you know, the late Lieutenant Abdullah Bass friends who were also in the army, you know, who were very close to the family. Um, like you said, you know, after the incident, you know, she, she didn't see them again. In fact, some who she would meet occasionally would avoid her, you know, and completely avoid her. They wouldn't even look at her or talk to her. And, uh, you know, it's, it's quite an emotional, it was quite an emotional uh, testimony, rather. Yes. But and, and they had, yes, you were saying. Yeah, but you know, Mr. Boy, sometimes you don't blame them. Because if you look at it, in those days, once someone is accused of something and you are associated with that person, again, they might come for you. So I think they did that, uh, that uh, to, to save their lives indeed. Because if you look at uh, Bubakar Sajang's testimony, when they arrested him, they were asking what was his relationship with Sana Sabali. Because probably he visited Sana Sabali or somebody said he visited Sana Sabali. Mm -hmm. So I think at that point, it was a good thing to refrain. But at the same time, you know, for the women, it's like they have been deserted, they have been abandoned by friends they knew before, friends of their husband who have been coming to their homes before. But at the same time, we can see, we can, we can try to guess why, you know, these things were happening like that. This, this, is, this is precisely it. This is what um, um, really historians of dictatorships have been saying for, for a very long time. Because what normally happens is that you have individuals each trying to do the reasonable thing. Yes. Just to be careful and be cautious. Yeah. But yet, 
each individual pursuing his own rational, if, if you like, um, 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 rational ends, mm -hmm. then you find out that collectively you end up in a damnation. Yeah. This was precisely what, 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 happened, right. what, what, happened, what happened to us. But, but the lady as well, qu quite fantastic, because afterwards they, they, had, two, they had a child, Asom. Omar, mm -hmm. but, but Abdullah, as far as she was aware, mm -hmm. Abdullah had two other, two, others, two, yes. two, two boys. Yes. And then afterwards at Brufut, she was posted at Brufut, teaching at Brufut, and then she went out looking for the another of Abdullah's sons. When, when she heard that Abdullah's son was also enrolled in the school, yeah. she went out looking, looking for him and was giving him lunch. That was quite fantastic. Yes, uh, uh, what I find quite extraordinary uh, with these uh, women, you know, I mean, uh, widows of, of November 11 uh, victims, really, I think um, they, they stood up to whatever challenges they were facing, and it wasn't like, okay, this is, the, the, the breadwinner is not there, you know, what do I do now? I mean, they, they didn't wait for people to support them. And as much as, of course, they were constrained in one way or the other, I think, you know, they, they, they showed great, I mean, uh, qualities, you know, they endured the pain, you know, and, and they stood up for their families as well, you know. Um, because she could have said, you know, those other kids are not, are not my biological children, but she didn't, mm -hmm. she didn't see things that way. And I think it was really uh, human of her, you know, to have gone that, to that extent. Absolutely. And even when she went to the UK, she, she lost touch with, with, with the boy, who was, was Usman, wasn't it? Usman mm -hmm. Bap? Lost touch, yeah. lost touch with the boy, but afterwards um, um, started communicating with, with him again, had to send some money for school fees. It, it, it continued, yeah. even, yeah. even, even, even the UK. Yeah, it's a good, it's a, it's a good thing anyway. The father is not there, probably. The family background is not strong. They all struggle together, and she must have knew what they were going through before. So it was a good thing. But again, we must commend them for their resilience yeah. Yeah, during the struggle. Absolutely. Um, the resilience, we'll say exactly the same thing in our next, um, next witness. Mm -hmm. um, Mbaya Sey, the wife of um, the late Lieutenant um, Jibril Sey. Um, she was born in 1967, and mm -hmm. by November 11th, 1994, they had two, two, two sons. Yeah. So t take us through um, her testimony. You, you, it was you who, who yes. attended the... Sure. Yes, take us through her testimony. Yes, it was also um, another emotional testimony, but quite interesting. Um, here is a witness who, uh, whose husband, you know, whose husband's name, you know, have come up many times in, in the different testimonies we've heard. Um, he, of course, uh, late Lieutenant Gibraltar says name, like I said, has been adversely mentioned by uh, witnesses, you know, um, as one of the victims of the uh, November 11 incident. Um, I remember when previous witnesses made mention of his name that he was one of those who were executed at Union Barracks. Um, for us, he said it was on the 11th of uh, uh, November 1994 uh, when the husband left very early for work, you know, as usual, and uh, and then didn't return because normally when he leaves in the afternoon he'll come back home. There was no call, and they didn't see him until um, the 13th because they were in limbo. But because of course they had the news that there was a shooter at the barracks, you know, at both Fajar and Union barracks. They thought maybe because of you know um, that particular incident, maybe he's busy at work. But yet, you know, they were concerned. They were not comfortable, you know. But then. They were there with the hope and belief that he would come back home, you know, once the dust settled down. Um, unfortunately, it was on the uh, 13th of November when the, the late Lieutenant Jibril says sister went to uh, the Den Daily Observer to complain that her brother, you know, had disappeared and she went with, with their father at the time. Um, so after the story was published, the following day, Sadi Haidara, who was, who was Defence Minister at the time, um, one of the junta members, you know, also, I mean, responded in an interview that he had with one of the uh, daily of our reporters and said that Gibral, the late Lieutenant Gibral say had actually died, you know, during the shootouts and that he's one of those uh, people, you know, who were trying to, or plotting to um, get rid of the AFPRC, you know, regime at the time. So that was the first time that they learned of his fate, that they got to know that, you know, he's no more, that he died, he's one of those who were executed. Uh, but funnily, um, they, they, you know, the family found this very hard to take because they couldn't understand how there was a shootout at the barracks at night. Here is someone who slept at his house, woke up the following day, which was on the 11, to go to work, you know, like any other normal day. And, and remember, this happened at night. So the family couldn't understand. So they still, you know, ha you know got harbored some hope, 
you know, that maybe, you know, just maybe he's detained somewhere, but, you know, he's still alive because since Salibu Haider had said that he died during the shootout, and here is someone who slept at his house, who was with his family throughout, woke up the following day, and, you know, the, the, it, was, it was really um, something that the family just couldn't take. Yes, absolutely, and, and, and that was the reason, because we, on that, that day as well, we had Omar Say, um, 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 Lieutenant Say's, um, the later brother. Lieutenant Say's brother, mm -hmm. who came and um, tendered documents, lots of documents, just to sh show mm -hmm. all the steps that the family had taken to find out what had happened, because that was really their, their argument. Mm -hmm. Apparently, the, the shooting uh, happened at night, but this morning, people saw him in the morning, yes. <laughs> yeah, on the 11th. So th th that was, that, that was that's why they went uh, out for this frantic search and then trying to find information, honestly, because obviously guns out at night and then the next morning somebody goes to work and then what, what, what should happen to him? He wasn't there at, uh, during the night. So obviously that's why, you know, they were adamant to go and find out what happened to him. But then they went to the, um, the, the Observer newspaper and they were able to get answers when Sadibu replied. But obviously it's about the same thing. The announcement made over the radio is the same as what Sadibu Haider replied, which the testimonies of witnesses later came to say is a lie, it's not true. But then, I know, we, we've seen the same thing happening again. But then with the family, this is the thing. And then at the time, um, they have two children and the, the last one was only two weeks old. Yes. So it was uh, at a very, very early stage of this child's life, the second child. It, it was in two fact, weeks, two weeks in fact, I think what gave the family hope, you know, that maybe he's detained somewhere. Remember, um, not only did he spend the night, you know, at, at, the, at, at, at his house, but he also passed by their family compound in Banjulunde, where his father was, yeah. and which mm -hmm. he normally does when he's going to work. He'll pass by, to you know, and then, you know, he is to seek his blessings, and then he will leave. So that very morning, the father saw him. I mean, his family member saw him. So they just couldn't couldn't get it, really. Yes, but but now evidence is coming in that he was rounded up. Immediately yes. he went to he went to Yundum in the morning. Yeah, when he, he arrived in the morning, up. when he, he arrived was in the morning, up. yes, and then obviously. As usual, that's how he was. He was killed. And, and so far, from what we know, he was among the people who were taken to the forest, the forest. The forest. either C4 or Nyambai, and that was where they were killed. <laughs> but Maya, Maya, Maya's case was, was quite interesting because afterwards, I, this this line that she used, "I raised my children on tears." To yes. me, that's the amazing. It was a poignant, it, so so touching. When I when I was going through the testimonies, I had to stop. I couldn't go on I mean, anymore. That yes. line, it was, it, it was poetic, it was, it was sad, it was pregnant with all sorts of meaning. You know, there is one thing of um, your husband being, I mean, being executed and you know he didn't die a natural cause, <laughs> he's killed. After knowing that and after being living with that torment inside you and the next day you have two children that you need to bring up and you have no other work to do, no, 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 you are not employed and then family feud probably yeah. came into it because obviously we don't know how it all happened. We cannot tell because I know some marriages before the marriage there are always problems and normally those are the kind of marriage that end up like this. But then the way it ended up with her is like she went home trying to raise the children, the children a two weeks old child and probably the other one would be probably two years plus and then raising them up, up to a certain level and then it's uh, alleged that the family came and took the children away from, from her. It must be very tormenting, Mr. Boj. Yeah. A few days later, when the husband died, and they will not even allow her to take even the bed they lie on. It's like yeah, only with your logic and so nothing else. I, I think these are uh, uh, personal issues that we cannot delve, you know, into. But uh, it's obvious that you know. Uh, absolutely, as far as she was concerned, yeah, she obvious. didn't get much help. Yeah. But again, l when we let's let's focus on, on the kids, for the instance, kids. was it Ibrahima? There was Ibrahima. Uh, yeah. Well, it's two of them. And, and two of them. And Alu. Al Al Alu. And, and the older one. Yes. But yes. obviously, you know, the bag Ibrahima went back way, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, he went through the bag way. And then until he reaches, I mean, on the way, uh, you know, obviously, this bag way people, they will go without enough yeah, money. Yeah. And I think along the way, he was stuck somewhere. In Libya, and didn't he have any money. Yeah. And I think. Uh, the family, the, the male side, were not happy because he left without telling them. Mm. And then again, the mother has to struggle. And then I think somebody sent 15000 for her. Yes. And then she managed to get the rest of the money and send it to the boy. You see, this is a mother's love for the child. Even though he went without even informing the mother herself. 
But then still now, it's my, it's my son, and I must stand up for him. And then he tried until he sent money. And then now, he's in Rome, he ended in, up in, Italy. Rome in Italy. Italy, you yeah. know. So but, but, but Alu's story wasn't like that. Yeah, yeah. Alu's story Alu was, was actually was a sad one. Yeah, that was a sad one. Yeah. Uh, but I think, I mean, if you look at how, you know, um, their kids have, have ended up, you know, it, the lesson here is that it's obvious you know, that they were constrained in many ways. And because here they've lost, you know, someone, you know, who actually was the end of the family, you know, the, you know, the, the, the breadwinner of the, the family is not there anymore and they don't have anyone who would really stood up for these kids and be able to take care of them, give them the best education, provide for their needs. When that individual is not there and now you have, I mean, you, I mean, being raised by a single mom really is quite challenging and I want to believe because of those difficulties is why, you know, the boy just couldn't take it anymore and he decided to embark on, on, on that, I mean, a perilous journey really. Yeah, but even the one left here, this Ali, who, who ended up having a problem, probably like a mental problem. Sometimes you have, you have to look at the psychological impacts of only a mother raising a child. Yeah. And especially when there was trouble at the beginning. Like this mom is alone, the father is, is, is not and is, is education not there. level could very could, low. I think he said he stopped at that grade that 11, grade isn't it? Yes, no, yeah, no, grade yeah. 11. Yes, Ali yes. went as far as grade 11. Mm -hmm. That's where his, his education ends. Mm -hmm. And then he couldn't go further, and he was, he was having these hallucinations and all those things. And then the, uh, the, the, the male part of the family accused him of smoking weed and cannabis. You know, but I think sometimes, you know, we tend to blame other forces, but it depends on the, the upbringing. And then the psychological trauma the child is, li is, is living with. How did he grow up? What was he hearing about the father, you know? Probably so. Sometimes you don't blame the children much. It depends on the environment. Oh, one is certainly not, not not blaming the, 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 the children at all. And it, it seems to me that perhaps this is just a tip of the iceberg of the wider fallout. Mm -hmm. This yes. is really what we are suffering now. Really, what we are seeing: the wider fallout of just so apparently killing one person, but you have no idea that you are affecting so many people, exactly. yeah. so many people um, 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 behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. But again, the, the, but um, the late Lieutenant says father, Ibrahim say. Very strong. Because when, when the brother was testifying, giving all these documents, writing constantly, was regularly hurrying them to, to find out about the truth. Uh, courageous man. Courageous Very man. courageous. Um, I think really, I don't think there is, we've, we've, we've had a scenario like that with the other witnesses. Um, I think he's really been very, very courageous to have stood up to the junta at the time to say, you know what, um, the information you're giving me is not correct. I saw my son on the morning of November 11, so there's no way you can tell me that he died on the 10th of November. It doesn't make any sense, you know. And once, you know, it became clear that he was one of those who were killed. Um, he went as far as asking for his entitlements. I mean, since now that you've killed him, whatever belong to him, whatever entitlements are there for him, give it to the family. Yet, they were denied. And in one of the documents that you know were submitted as, as exhi exhibits by his his brother, um, it's just a one line, you know, w one one sentence letter from 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 your, the, the junta at the time to say. Your application, you know, for the late Lieutenant says entitlements is rejected. And that's it. Which for me really cold. Uh, well, cold. Very, steely, very, very completely cold. heartless. Really. really. Completely. Without without sympathy at all. What's yeah. and, 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 and Bayang Baya Baya still suffering. Still, yeah. So I think they asked for perhaps here they will want to see the, the corpses, at least to give them a decent burial. Yeah. And one would expect the TRRC, perhaps sooner or later, to go and exhume the, 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 the corpses and, and then give it back to the families to, to give them a decent burial. Yeah, obviously, uh, yeah. most of these widows, they requested for, for to exhume the, the, the bodies and then so that they can have a decent burial. And that conforms with our you know the traditions of our society, our religion. I think it's a proper way. I know it speaks to somebody who said, let the dead li rest in peace. But how would they rest in peace if they are not buried properly or the way they are they're supposed to be buried? So I think, you know, it's a good idea. As long as it's the request from the family members, let them heal to their request. Yeah, I mean, of course, you have people who would, I mean, um, against the idea of exhuming, you know, these bodies and giving it to their families for befitting burial. Um, of course, like I said, I mean, you know, much more I, than that. They had yeah. no regard for humanity. For humanity, really. Something as basic as that. Well, honestly, because I mean, like I've said in one of our our, our editions, um, 
could it us anywhere I wouldn't be supported you know by any one with a sound mind really uh, but I think even whatever crime one commits you know once you have them with you take them to court present your evidence whatever the I mean, the, the court decides, then so be it, you know. And even if, if one is going to, for instance, you are sentenced to death by whatever means, by the court, I mean, once that is done, you should be given to your family for befitting burial, I believe. For me, I think this really, common sense alone should, should tell you that, you know, the way they went about summarily executing these, these people who were allegedly plotting, you know, a coup, you know, and, and burying them in a mass grave, the manner in which we are told that they did, really. You uh. know, to be honest, Mr. Mboj, uh, in our society, we normally visit graveyards. We know that. Mm. We go and visit our father's grave, our mother. We go and visit the grave, and we stand there and pray for them, because that's the only thing they need. They cannot pray for us. Even though if you pray at home, it's the same thing. But we want to see the evidence that here is where my dad lies. So can you imagine, again, the psychological tr torture of knowing so and so is dead, but at the same time, not knowing where he is buried. Probably you'll be thinking he's buried in the jungle. Probably you would think he's chopped into pieces. I mean, it's better to know that this is where this one, this so and so lies. It think brings closure. Yes. At least to a, to a very difficult, a very, very difficult experience. I think, I think uh, one thing too, I think um, we should be thankful because uh, for, for the fact that they could, they could, they could have buried, I mean buried them in, in, in the forest. But see what God does. They brought them to the to the to the, camp, to, the to the barracks, and now we all uh, I mean all the soldiers who were there, and I want to believe even the TRC, I mean, of course with with, with the investigative team, no. would by now know where these people were buried because we have living witnesses, you know. If if these people were buried in the barracks at, the, at that time, it would have been very difficult forest. at the, at the forest rather. It would have been very difficult yes. to spot out yes. where this mass grave is, yes. Yes. because by now who knows. Trees would yeah, have grown and all of that. Yeah, but I understand even at the, at the camp as well, they've erected something on it, you know. But then it's, it's good that you know this is where these people are buried. If it were at the forest, it would have been, you know, yeah, a different course. case, really. True. Remarkable. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, gentlemen. So now let's just move on quickly to our next witness. Mm. Now, we had Ahmad Jangum. He's currently serving, isn't he? He's a yes, um, captain. Captain. Captain Omar Jangum. Isn't he at Yundum, um, office commander, isn't he? Yeah. He's, in, he's, in, he's a commander in, in, in Yundum right now. He was born in 1966. He enlisted in 1987. But this particular witness was called to testify on a particular, one particular episode yeah. that took place in June 1995. Take us through his testimony. Yes, um, his testimony focused mainly on the uh, alleged assassination of um, the late... Uh, Finance Minister Usman Koro Sisei, um, who served under the uh, junta, you know, um, he said he was serving as an as as, as the guard Arabi commander, guard commander yeah. you know, of uh, a section that was posted at the residence of uh, then uh, junta minister, local government and land, um, young retired Lieutenant Yanko Ture, and uh, he said on this particular day they were there. And uh, he received a call, you know, that the former junta member had called his wife, and then the wife called him and said, "Come and answer." Uh, someone, in fact, I understand. He said the wife didn't even tell him that it was Yankuba. He said, "Come and answer. You have a call." So when he came, um, he received the call, and it was Yankuba Ture who was on the other end of the, of the call, and said to him that, um, "I want you to take my family to uh, then vice." Chairman of the Junta, Edward Singhatis residence, there is a birthday party. And and after that, there is a boat coming, I mean around the beach. Uh, it's loaded with arms, you know, weapons. You make sure you go, you know, and survey the place, check the place, see if you find anything you let me know. Make sure you go there and patrol with your men. So he said he did that. Um, but then he said he could remember that very day that uh, then Junta Chairman Jame was traveling out of the country, and then um, that was the OAU summit. Exactly he, he, in, in Ethiopia. So he said um, he took the family there. Young Kubatu had left to go to the airport, and then from there, he, when they came back, they had to remove their uniforms because 
because they didn't want to attract attention when they are out there in the in the that uniforms. That was the order given to them. Yeah, no in the uniforms and, and, and weapons, because this was exactly the order given to uh, them by Yankuba Ture. Yes, apparently Yankuba said to them, "Go in your muftis." In your muftis. So they use their common sense that yes. they cannot hold their guns. guns. Imagine being in mufti mm -hmm. and then holding your holding guns. Yes, it looks then funny. That, that could have yeah. caused alarm, alarm. Yeah. amongst people and, 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 they, and, the, and yeah. the like. Yes. So he said, um, "It was one answer, Mendy, who was an oddly at the time." Um, you know, who borrowed him a suit, you know, and sat as well, and his other colleagues, his other two colleagues. So they left and went to the Fajara beach where they were. Did he say three of them? Three of them, yes. yes there were three, three of, them. of them, he said. Yes. So he said, it. after when they arrived at the beach, it started raining. He said they went up to around the Senegambia area and came back, you know, they were just going and coming. And then they got tired. So they went to the then Junta But they didn't see anything. They didn't see anything, yes. So they, they came home first. They, yes, they, they came, came home. home. He said they came home, yeah. and then um, they met Captain Edward Singer outside, and there were a fleet of cars, vehicles uh, outside as well. So it was. He said Edward was. I mean, his uniforms. You know, his uniform was wet. He wore this American camouflage, and he was smoking. And, and the muddy boots. Muddy boots, yes. Mm -hmm. So he approached him, then complimented him. You know, their own ways of greeting. So once he did that, he said Edward has had asked him where they came from and then he explained you know that we were asked to go on patrol the beach and stuff and then it was said to him you people should go back again go back again yeah. you know and of course it didn't make sense to him but he dare not question edward's orders because one edward was senior and two he was vice chair, chair chairman of the council at the time mm -hmm. the second most powerful person in the country so there's no way he would dare question edward's orders so he went back with his guys again you know, the same routine, going and coming, going and coming. It, w it was raining. It was it? raining. It was raining. Yes, it was well. raining. Yeah. So when they got tired, they branched off, went to the Dan Junta spokesperson's house, Captain uh, Ibu Jalo. So they went to his, his, his residence, he said they knocked the door, and then um, they were received by one of his orderlies, who he actually knew. So they went in there where they were. In fact, he said he slept off. Later, he, I mean, they, they woke him up, and so they went back. and. You know, he said when they went back, really, you know, the house, the, the, the place really looked kind of messy. But, you know, yet he's, he couldn't tell if something had really happened there. But then he could see that the place was a bit messy. Until the following morning, um, when Yankuba's wife brought newspaper to him and said, H did, you, did you hear what, how you heard what happened? Have you seen this? And then he saw it. You know, but he said even at the time, he was wondering how um, a state, you know, minister, you know, because the story then at the time, you know, was that his car was it found was accident, somewhere it around was, it was the and it was burned and yes. he was, you know, found in there as well. So he just couldn't understand that. Of course, to him, he said he was a bit suspicious that just maybe he was assassinated, you know, before but that. Still but still, he had not made a connection, connection yes. between that wild goose chase. Essentially, <laughs> he was sent on a wild goose chase sure. <laughs> on that wild goose, goose chase and mm -hmm. the fact that there was this killing. Yes. Until later on, there was something he saw yes. which, which, which reconnected in his own head. Uh, if, if you could remember, I mean, just, just a few months after that, Ibu Jalo left the country and went to um, the U.S., you know. So it was when Ibu Jalo left the country and then um, he said, he ha after, after some time, he had this, you know, Ibu Jalo in one of his interviews, you know, saying that Koro was killed in Yankuba's house. And then he started... That was when he started joining the dots, connecting the dots, and he started making sense to him that, you know, it's highly likely that Koro was killed at Yankuba's house. Well, uh, yes. during the testimony, he made it clear. He said he believed that mm -hmm. he was fooled by yes. Yankuba. And now he understands why they went on that uh, uh, patrol, saying say there is a ship coming with arms, you know. That was place. actually what Ibu Jalo said. It wasn't Ibu Jalo had written that, mm -hmm. that the guards were fooled. Yes. yes. That was when he allowed then he could connect the dots, yeah. as, as you put it. Then yes. he could make a connection that, ah, that's possibly true. Yes. We were sent on a wild goose chase, yeah. so that they could do they whatever, could carry out, uh, they could, they could they carry they out whatever, whatever, whatever they, they wanted to carry out. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, his testimony was really very short. Yes. But it was important for us to go into the details, sure. because when it comes to our next <laughs> witness, this is quite, quite, quite fascinating, because they would give testimonies on the same event, mm -hmm. yet their testimonies are like chalk and cheese, completely, <laughs> so, so <laughs> radically, radically different. Mm -hmm. So our final witness was Ensa <coughs> Mendy.
He was an orderly to Yanko Bature. Mm -hmm. um, he was born in 69 and he joined the army. When was it? 1990. Mm -hmm. So, with him, let's go straight to around, um, um, let's go to November 10th. Yes, his, um, he said he was serving as an orderly to Yanko Bature at the time. Um, and I remember he said they went home, then Yanko called them again. It was around in the evening, then he called them again and said they should report back. So when they went to his house, they went to Edward's place, joined with Edward's Otley's, and they went to State House, um, with, with, oh, that's where they met Sana and Jame, and this is where they were um, briefed. They were briefed, was you it know, by Alma Mo Mane? Alma Mo Mane, yes. you know, Alma Mane, and they were issued with, you know, new guns, rifles, AK-47s, and all these sophisticated weapons. They, they had, had the same Alma Mo yes, yes. at their disposals at the time. and. They, they were issued to them by Alma Mumani, and, and then they were told that they were going to foil a coup at both the Union and Fajara Baas, that there was a coup and which they were going to foil. So they went with this mindset that, you know, we're going to war, you know. And, and, but, and but before that, I think we heard from JCB Mendy, wasn't it, yeah. that Jami came and spoke to them. They spoke to them. Remember, that was the Belai Walai Talai, mm. you know, if I, if I came with you people, many families would weep and that sort of thing. But he said he didn't hear anything. No, yes. he, 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 he didn't said Jami didn't come down, yes. didn't talk yeah, to them. That's what he said. So that, that, was, that was one of his, the, the, the contradictions. Okay, and then they left. Yes, and, and then, then what happened? And then mm. they left. Um, he said um, Lieutenant Barrow was caught at the uh, was caught by Corporal Malafi Kor, um, who uh, I don't think I don't, I don't I don't know if he's still serving in the army. But if you can remember, um, in 2009, he's one of those officers uh, who were accused to have also, you know. Uh, that he is part of those, the, the Lantombong batch, you know, that were accused of plotting a coup at the time. So he said, um, at the, but at the time he was uh, a corporal, and uh, it was um, Corporal Malafikor and his men at the gate who arrested uh, Barrow and uh, removed all his, you know, uh, he said, they said, he said that he had jujus, you know, on him and all of that, which uh, is the first time we're hearing that. And, you know, once he was captured, he said he was mercilessly beaten and taken to but, the but cells before, there. Before yeah, but before he considered that. Exactly. Before, he, he actually admitted that he was, I mean, tortured. Um, you know, it, 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 it took like 10 minutes, you know, of denials here and there before he eventually accepted that, yes, he was seriously, I mean, mercilessly beaten. He, he was, he was, he, he, his style was quite reminiscent. For me, mm. it was quite reminiscent of J.C.B. JCB Mendes' Mendes style. Yeah, exactly. Because you would ask him, um, was he beaten up? He will say no. Yeah. And then when you break it down for him and tell him, was he hit? He will say, say tell you yes. <laughs> was he kicked? He, he will say <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> so in the end, was he beaten up? Let's just take a look at this clip. <laughs> then you'll see what we're talking about. Was he hit? Yes, sir, he said. Was he butt struck? With a rifle? Yes. Well, uh, you see, it is dark. So anyone can use any weapon to do it. Is this a situation where you don't want to testify so want about to test a blatant violation of the person's rights? Is this the case? You don't want to see no evil. Is that it? No, 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 sorry. That is not the case. He can be, if, if at all I happen to, show, uh, to see him f physically like this, when he is beaten, he is butt I will know. But you have just accepted that he was hit. Yes, sir. Was he butt struck? That's why I didn't see that with my eye. Was he kicked? Yes, sir. Essentially, he was beaten. To frame it, he was beaten. Why didn't you accept in the first instance that he was beaten? Um, because, you know, the people were scrambling upon him. So what I saw was they were removing... Uh, is that the reason why you did not say in the first place that he was beaten? Yes, sir. I take it you did not want to answer the question in the first instance? Not that, sir. I'll move on. i leave it at that. We accept he was beaten. Yes, sir. How badly? All other witnesses said he was beaten mercilessly. In your case, what do you say? After that process, I did not see him facially. No, we are talking about this same process. Yes. Let's, go to, let's not go to the other processes. This particular instance, 
what happened. Was he mercilessly beaten or not? It's not written on the ceiling. I am thinking, so my mind has gone back to the real day. It's what I'm focusing on, so that I can recall my mind. Then I'm able to answer your question. Tell us. You've been interviewed several times. Yes, sir. And all during all this period, you've been casting your mind to what has happened. Yes, sir. Tell us the truth. Remember, it's only the truth that shall set you free. Yes, sir. Was he beaten mercilessly? He is beaten. I want the qualification. Was he beaten mercilessly or not? Yes, sir. He was beaten mercilessly. Okay, gentlemen, this is, <laughs> this is it, quite, quite, quite interesting. Yeah. So throughout, actually, his, his, his testimony, we, we, we will get that quite evasive, um, reluctant to, to, to give um, information. He, he essentially clammed up. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we, we, we've seen that happening times. again. And we've seen him in a hurry to leave Yundu Barracks yes. in his statement. his statement. He was really in a hurry to leave Yundu Barracks because the moment he said these two people are captured, and the next minute is, we went to Fayara Barracks. Yes. Out. And then the council said, no, 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 let's go back to Yudnum Barracks again. Because he was in a hurry, because we know, you know, things happen. People are captured, put into a truck. He didn't want to say all that, yeah. you know. Okay, Dotfal and Basirubaro were actually uh, captured there. And they yes. were mercilessly beaten at Yudnum Barracks. Yeah. Okay, before he admits that they, are, they were beaten, it took, it took time. It took time sure. for him before he will admit that they are beaten, you know. So at the end he said they were beaten, yes. And then he, he removed himself from it. But then again, you know, with the experience of the lead council, it's like, were you part of the beating? And then gradually he admitted that he was part of it. Yes. But we've seen again reluct uh, the reluctance in him, you know, not to be part of it. That's why, you know, in, in later testimonies we'll see, you know, things happen that they said it's the oddest who did it, but he said he wasn't there. That was, that was quite interesting to me as well. Um, it seems as if he could, he could concede, he could accept collective responsibility. Yeah. Yes. When Cancel said to him, it was all the orderlies yes. that did that. He said, yes, all yes. the orderlies did that. Sure. And he's part of the orderlies. Yes. Then he can see how he could be guilty. But with him individually, individually. he had not done, done anything. Yeah. He, was, he, was, he, was, uh, he was trying to wriggle himself out. It was, it was quite fascinating watching sure. him perform. It was like a performance. It was like a, th a theater, a play. He was performing how to wriggle uh, himself exactly. out of it. Uh, it's, it's only actually at one place that he admitted in taking part in the killings. That's Fajara. That's it. So yeah. from Yundum, Fajara. Yeah. So Tell us about Fajara. Yes, yes, he said uh, when they were done, you know, with Basiru Baro and Dotfal after they arrested them and tortured them and then took them to the cells in Yundum, he said um, they were asked by Sana, I mean, he actually ordered them to now go to Fajara Barracks where they went. Um, he said at Fajara Barracks, you know, they received some resistance, you know, but then some of the soldiers, guards who were there, you know, had actually decided to, to run away, you know, to, to preserve their lives because. They were overpowered, I mean, apparently. Now, of so course, we know that it wasn't even, these people are not fighting, it, even it yeah. wasn't a battle. It wasn't a battle. according to what we heard, it was a tactic. Because once you started, I mean, moving towards somebody deemed an enemy, and you are firing, if he doesn't fire back, probably you catch, you, you, you catch the person by surprise. Yes. But they were firing and retreating at the same time. So it was a tactic just to slow down these people so that they can just evade yeah. and have their way. So that was what was happening at the time, according to what we had from the witnesses. Yes. yes. So, mm -hmm. so he said um, there too. He kind of, um, you know, parried his testimony, and he was like, you know, then we somewhere captured. We took them to the to the football field. Yeah. You know, then then Sana asked us to fire. You know, he said we all fired, and two men fell. Yeah. You know, but y y you could you could tell um, that, I mean, even the lead counsel was wasn't happy with, you know, the way. I think. He, of course, like others would say, was kind of a hostile witness because he wasn't really cooperating, you know. And um, you could tell that he, he knew more than he was saying because um, it is only when he is forced, you know, in a way to, to admit that he does. Because even at Yunum Bara, uh, at Fajara, rather, uh, when, when they asked him, um, were there any shootings? He said, yes, some men were shot. Some men, like how many men, who and who? And then he said, no. Um, when we when we got there and after they were firing and running, then we captured some of them. Then they took them to the field and we fired and two fell. But it, it's quite, um, I mean, ironic how 
a group he of didn't soldiers. Want to go into the details. Yes, he didn't. He didn't go in, into detail to tell he us. He could have told us about Dr. Fan, his, his condition, his condition, he his condition, like what people have said. He, did. he didn't want to go into all that. Mm -hmm. He was there. He was an orderly. He could have tell us the condition of I mean, Basiru Baru and Dr. Fan, but he didn't. Mm -hmm. Yes, you fire at them. Yes, I was part of those who fired at them, and then two people fell. That's it. Only two people. You you you, you ask a group of men to stand. You fire, and only two fell. What mm -hmm. happened to the other bullets? Mm -hmm. Stray bullets? Or were you fighting into the air? Who knows? But then that's, that's, that's his testimony, anyway. Yes, and as far as he was concerned, he didn't know the two that fell yeah. yes. or so whatever happened to the bodies yes. Yes. afterwards. He said he had no idea. Yeah, if in do, we had uh, the odd list that, that took part in the shootings, uh, plus the, some of the junta men, and also the burial process. But for him, he didn't know what happened to the bodies. Yeah. Yes. So, so from Fajara, wouldn't they return to Yundum? Yes. yes. They Prime. went back. They yes. went back. Mm -hmm. They went back to Yundum. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said when they arrived at Yundum, Sana had ordered, I mean, uh, Corporal Alaji Kanyi, I mean, who had testified earlier, to go and get Fafa Nyang from the cells. So as soon as they brought Fafa out, he said Edward has shot him, I mean, first sh shot him, um, you know, in the stomach, he fell. And then um, Lamin Kuli, Private Lamin Kuli, finished him off. You know, mm. and then that was when it's he the second, the second uh, witness the second to witness say that actually there was an accident. It was um, deliberate. Yes, uh, right. but then you, you realize throughout this testimony, I mean, that was the only point where he had go into in detail to explain every, I mean, step, you know, like to explain everything step by step as to how it happened, who shot yes. Fafa, how he was killed. In fact, he went as far as defending himself to say, you know what, um, what Kuri was saying isn't true because yeah. any professional soldier would know that that was deliberate. And in fact, he also denied, you know, the, 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 the theory that Kuli was running towards Fafa to save his life. He said that didn't happen. No one, I mean, ran towards Fafa. He, he, said, even, yes. he even went, in fact, he yeah, said vividly that Fafa's intestines were out. Way he out. could see all that. Yeah. I said, oddly, he was there. Mm -hmm. That point was very clear. And then he was mm -hmm. taking his time explaining everything about what happened sure. to Fafa Nyang. Mm -hmm. But because he's a large can, he's not him. So, yeah, said, I mean, he could take his time and Selective explain. lucidity. Yes. So That's there it. he was quite lucid. Yeah. Yes. But when it came to his own... Um, um, work. You have to squeeze his, 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 his wrist before you. Yeah, well, you had to take him round the block yes. <laughs> a few times. I remember <laughs> he even stood up to demonstrate how, you know, um, Fafa Nyang was, was, was shot his by Fafa Fafa Nyang, uh, by Lamin, Lamin Kohli, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how he aimed at him and, and, and all of that. And uh, he said it wasn't accidental, he denied that. Mm -hmm. Now, regarding, um, you know, the, the soldiers who were killed, I mean, executed at the barracks. Uh, at the forest, uh, in, in Nambai Forest, and, and Sifu as well. Um, that do he said, the soldiers, you know, the officers, and, and uh, their orderlies also, you know, took part in the executions that they were ordered by Sana to, to uh, you know, fire. And he said, which they all did. But at first... But was he there? Did he say no, that he, he said go? He no, said he, he, said he wasn't he there. He said he wasn't he there, but he, wasn't he, was, there. he was informed, you know, by colleagues that all the orderlies were there fired. And but what I found also quite interesting is how an orderly at the time I mean, of course, at least we know we, we would always be with, with whatever individual they assigned to, to you know, to, to serve as bodyguards to. I mean, if you are my orderly, being a state, I mean, secretary at the time, because junta members were serving as, uh, I mean, were serving in cabinet, it just doesn't add up. It doesn't make any sense that how did he, I mean, leave? You know what happened? He caught, I mean, it, he caught it short. He didn't mention going to the forest. Yes. He didn't mention going to Sifo. He said from there they left for State House. Where state when house. they arrived, they were giving drinks and they were celebrating. celebrating yes. But for him, he You're was right. sad that, inside. That, that was so quite he, interesting. he omitted the forest, he omitted Sifu. Yeah, yes. And those were crucial, uh, crucial points uh, in the investigation. But he omitted them completely. He didn't say mm -hmm. from there we went to Nambai Forest, do this, and we went to Sifu. Or oh, just like JBC Mendy said, JCB rather, we went what I sneak yeah, out. Yeah, but yeah. for him, it wasn't even that. For him, it was like, caught it short from there, we went back to it's, it's the house. They, they compared notes, you know, those you know, two, you know, this <laughs> is, their this testimonies. Is, you, know, you know, Mr. Boch, um, look at it this way. Now, the very person that you are serving as an oddly to, and was, I mean, at, we've heard from several witnesses, mm -hmm. was at, 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 the, at the forest where the executions mm -hmm. took place. Mm -hmm. And now you are telling me that after the barracks, you went with that person and the other I mean, council members in the audience, straight to state house where you, you were celebrating. 
after killing your own colleagues. Yes. It just doesn't add up because we know now especially all of these people were at the, at the forest. The time he said, was it around 3, 4? Around 3, 4. When we've got all the test people's testimonies telling us that by 3, 4, they were at the forest. Yes. <laughs> they were, they were, so it just um, doesn't add up, really. It doesn't they were, add up they were doing. to us. So at State House, he said, they were jubilating. jubilating. Then from there, he, he went home. Yes. What, was that what, what, what happened to him that, that day? That is what he said. Okay. So now the other part of his testimony was June 1995. Yeah, Kurosi's um, assassination. <laughs> yes. Mm. So take us through his, and here we will always be referring to, to Ahmad Jangam's uh, um, testimony because they're completely, complete yes. opposite. Yes. So according to him, what happened in, in June 1995? According to our, now, our man, Mr. We, we know from um, Ahmad Jangong's testimony that they are guards and they are orderlies. And that Ensa was one of the orderlies. Now, he wasn't part of the um, guards. But in his testimony, he had made it sound like he is one of the guards. But we know he's an orderly. Of course, he's admitted that he's an, he served as an because orderly. Because if he's an orderly, before. he should be at the airport. He should be at the airport. airport. So that's why he became yeah. a guard. All right. Um, so he said, he was with Jangom and that they were six in number. Now we've heard from Jang Captain Jangom that they were three in number. They were three in number. All right? Yes. He said they were six. Okay? And not only that as well. And, and Jangom mentioned one yeah. of them, wasn't it? Um, Abdullah Bojang Tuluba. Yeah. Uh, there was <laughs> Abdullah Bojang Tuluba. Tuluba. But he couldn't remember the third one. Yes. But he said categorically that it wasn't Ensa. Yes. I mean, not remember, yes. could not remember but, but who yes. it was, but, it wasn't Ensa. but knew that it wasn't Ensa yes. at all. Because Ensa was an orderly, orderly. completely different from the guards. There yes. were only three guards. Sure. Yes. And, and, and he also said in his testimony that um, he's one of those who went to the beach, you know, to see, or, I mean, survey the place to see whether the canoe that Yankuba said was coming, filled with arms, was really there. You know, he, he said he was part of a team that was sent to the beach, which we now know. Or we've heard from Captain Jangom that that wasn't the case. Yeah. Um, not only that as well, he said when he returned back... And, and they went in uniform. In uniform. That's whereas, what he said. Whereas Jangom yes. said they were in Moftis. In Moftis. So he said six people, Jangom said, said three. Three. <laughs> quite interesting. Well, Mr. Yeah. there's something to this. <laughs> quite fascinating, um, yeah. Jangom said he's the one who borrowed them. Yes. The track suit and something he put on. Yes. But again, that brings me, because I was saying he could be, he was at the airport as an orderly. But in that case, young Kuba wasn't at home. He was at the airport. So how did he manage to give them clothes if he's not at home? Mm -hmm. Yes. You, yes. Can, you see what I'm talking Absolutely. about? Sure. Ab so Absolutely. probably he's at home yeah, because young Kuba said he, he, he gave us uh, his own uh, uh, clothes for us to so wear. That means he was not at the airport then. That means he was at home to mm -hmm. give them clothes. Mm -hmm. So unless if he didn't go with them, mm -hmm. But then he must be at home to, to actually give them his own clothes and say, where are this? Where are you are going? So, yes. yes, but but quite interestingly, he couldn't recall anybody else out of the six. The only person he could say was Jangom. Even with Jangom, he couldn't quite get it. I think he tried to say that Ngom. It was the council who said to him Jangom. Yes. And yet, according to Jangom, the other person, Tuluba, mm -hmm. Tuluba was there. And this guy, he said, Tuluba was his batchmate. batchmate. So one would have thought that if they had gone together with Tuluba, he would have been able to say yeah, that, the problem yeah. is that he went. must be at home, but he must, you remember he has a mobile phone at the time. Well, that is what he said. Well, he said he was what? He was paying $400 a month. When his salary. And yeah. then his salary, 1002 And then even with the mobile phone. At first he said it was a big one. Yes. And then when, you know, council, when council was really getting into details, he said it like a small Nokia. So council even said, what do you mean small and big at the same time? <laughs> 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 but did they have mobile phones in those days? No, that's yeah, there were. I mean, we it was just coming in, there was a Motorola, there was a huge <laughs> Motorola, we can remember, we can remember <laughs> some of that. In the early, yeah, I remember, mean, my the dad used to have one, yes. quite big one. But highly unlikely that a private soldier, your, your money, you don't have much, and it's not like today where maybe your cousin or your brother or somebody from outside can send you these things. Mm -hmm. The remittance is it's much easier for one to and get I these things now. And I wonder why would Young Kuba so call? quite interesting. Why would uh, uh, they, uh, like the Young Kuba called on uh, the wife instead of calling him directly when you have a mobile phone? Yes. From the mm -hmm. airport. Because sure. Young Kuba called Jangom to say, take my family to a birthday party. 
Why won't you have call him directly on his mobile phone? If, if that's it's easier to, to call him directly on his mobile phone. I think his, his testimony uh, was quite controversial, really. Mm. And, uh, but he also tried to connect the dots again. Mm. I was, uh, in fact, I thought I was thinking whether he was listening to Django. That's what I'm thinking, because was he there at the same time and looking at the screen, or was he listening to Django? Because he kind of, kind of, to follow uh, Django's trend, but then the uh, divers at, 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 at most of the places. Mm. I mean, you, it was raining, for him it was windy, it wasn't raining. You yes. see the, the and the even the, the route, the, even the route they took, according yeah. to Jangom, it was Fajara Golf Course. Fajara golf I, I know those steps very, very well. When we were younger, we, we, we played there a lot, so we know those steps. But for him, it was Palma River. Palma River, yes. yes. They were, they were, no, they were from Palma River. Absolute, absolutely. And when he was asked the, the the weather, what was the weather like? He said it was windy. Windy. And the, the sea was rough, so he didn't mention anything about rain. So it was always the lead council who was prompting him. Mm. He said, wasn't it raining? He said, well, not too much. It was a drizzle. <laughs> <laughs> and then even when, <laughs> when, when the name um, Abdullah Bojang was mentioned, he said, well, I might have said no, possibly he was there. Yeah. So he was looking for, it's almost like he was looking for the council to give him prompts. But possibly he must have known about something like that, that something like that happened. Mm -hmm. yes. There were people who were sent to the beach. beach. So perhaps he decided then to shroud himself around that story, with that story, yeah. as a way to escape. And say, look, perhaps it's my, my statement against somebody else's of statement. Course, yeah. So he's blagging it. This is English term. He's trying to blag it, <laughs> to just bluff his way through. W what do you think? <laughs> well, that, that can only be the case, because obviously, two people, the same incident, and, and, and your, 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 how would I call it, your statements are different. Obviously, that's a cause for concern. Now, it's left to our judgment. Who is telling the truth? Who is not telling the truth? You have to listen to both, both sides. Yeah. You know, but I mean, obviously, you know, the tendency here is that I think a lot of people, what I saw on social media, a lot of people tend to believe in Jangom than in, in, in Esa. Yeah. That's what I've, I've, I've seen in social media. I've mm -hmm. seen comments what people are saying, Esa, you are hiding something. Yes, so quite interesting. So when he returned from the beach, they returned yeah, to Yankuba's house. From the beach, they returned to um Yankuba's house and you could see that Yankuba's I mean the house was messy. dirty with mud, you know, quite messy. Water, Yankuba's uniform water. was burnt, you yes. know, yes, he he mentioned that as well. You know, and the place was, was so untidy. Yes. That he said he could he could remember when they came back from the from, from the beach. And mm. he also said um he later heard from who he wouldn't say, but he said he later heard that Koro was murdered you know, and then uh, the yeah, Yankuba's house and bond. He said he had all these things from people. But then he suspect it must have happened at Yankuba's house. That was where he connected the dots. Yes. He said he remembered the burnt patches, wasn't it, on yes. Yankuba's uniform, uniform, wasn't it, what, what he had on, and, and the way he found... The, the yes, and, he, and, and I remember he said Yankuba looked quite, you know, nervous, you yeah, know, worried, worried seemed really agitated, agitated so, so, you know, yeah. So and and he, mentioned, and he said he suspected, he said he even yes, suspected that suspect Koro must have been killed in Kill, Yankuba's house. Yeah. That's what he suspected. Mm -hmm. I mean, he did mention that uh, clearly. But obviously, I mean, that's what uh, Jangbom said. And obviously, if they are together, uh, as he claimed, he must have said the same thing. Yes. And, and in the end, even with that, the, the final remarks, you know, they are given opportunity to give final remarks. And the lead council had to stop them and say, look, yeah. we may very possibly ask him to come back. Back. So we might see this, this gentleman which, again. Which, which I suspect will happen. We, we, we might see him again. Yeah. But, uh, probably, you know, with all, their, their, uh, with, with all this mix up and all these things they are saying now, it's possible if they come back again, they might as well go to the point. Who knows whether they will come clean. They will say, look, there is no point. Or somebody might advise them at home. They are friends. Family may say, look, you've done it. Go there and tell the truth. And then it's only the truth that, 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 that can set you free. Just like Kanye has done. Kanye has done a lot of things. And he came out and said it. Although people are saying he left some behind. But at least we know he told us what he has done. Mm -hmm. At least he didn't, he didn't lie. At least even if he leaves some behind. Mm -hmm. But at least he told us what people want to hear. Well, so you know, far, he JCB mainly was an orderly, wasn't it? So far, the orderlies are proving to be quite difficult. But as one, one of the witnesses said, they said the orderlies were even more crazy than the, the junta members. Yeah. Yes. So perhaps they have a lot more to hide than, 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 yes, than, 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 than most other, yeah. other people. Of course. Um, yes, we've, 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 we've come to the, to the, to the, to the, to the end of our, our, um, our roundup mm. of, of, of the testimonies. These four are gone. So the, um, the proceedings will resume On tomorrow. Yeah. Yes. So, um, so far, look, let's look at the stories. There was a new story 
around this JCB Mendy, something happened there. Was he arrested? Yeah, um, he was arrested, you know, around the Jibora Oshiliti border. I mean, allegedly, I mean, trying to, to, to leave the country uh, for whatever reason, we don't know. But this is, you know, we understand now, of course, it's been confirmed officially as well, um, that he was arrested, you know, and we understand that he was charged with murder. And uh, I, I saw something on social media as well um, that he has been released on bail. Um, how to, we, we cannot confirm for now. Yes, and, and not, not only, you know, arrested, but also directives um, were given him to be terminated at his workplace because he works at the Gambia International yeah, yeah. Airlines. As so head of security. Also, uh, yes, they've also given them directives from the Ministry of um, Justice. Justice that let his service be terminated. Yes, but this is exactly what we were talking about. People who are adversely mentioned and they're still serving. It's quite interesting that they're taking this line with this one. What about others? Then it's true. Well then, then what about what happens? Yeah. What happens with it's the true. The but the but the for him, what prompted everything? Because to me, I think it's like after when the TRR, um, TRRC mandate ends, after two years, then they will make their recommendations and the probably proceedings uh, will follow. But we've seen him, you know, being the first you know, was it the reason because he was trying to abscond? Like, I mean, to abscond, we don't know. But then, if he's charged for murder, well, that means for him, I mean, it's, it's, it's too early. <laughs> so <laughs> it seems as if there might be prosecutions running along, running alongside uh -huh. the proceedings yeah, going on, on yeah. depending no. on. Because I've seen someone wrote on Facebook and said, I mean, if Jesse B. Mendy would be charged for murder, what about Alaji Kanye? You know, Alaji Kanye is still cooperating with the, with the, with the TRC. Sure. You know, he didn't try to run away. He's, he's around. This one, according to what they say, yeah. he's trying to, to leave the country, to abscond. So I think it's different from Alaji Kanye. Yeah. As now. I believe this. But then it's only uh, the TRRC who can explain. Or yeah. probably the Ministry of Justice has their own thing. They mm -hmm. can act on their own way without the TRRC. Probably they are they'll have to liaise. You know, in accordance with what they are to do. They will always yeah. liaise. The, the Ministry uh, of, of Justice, the Attorney General, will always liaise with the TRRC, with the chair, mm -hmm. and they will determine, depending on their mandate, yeah. they will determine perhaps what might be taken to court. For instance, with the Young Kubature incident, for, for, you know, that's, that's one thing where and he, his apparent tampering with witnesses, then that would give them way to take it to the yeah. law. Yeah. Perhaps with other witnesses as well, depending on you know what what one what, what one might have done sure. so whether they will be running prosecutions alongside this then we'll have to wait and see yeah. we even we have to talk to the TRRC about it thank uh, you and sure. and and gentlemen and right now <laughs> <laughs> i give you final word yeah, final final word. Word. <laughs> the ministry also give a uh, warning to the general public i mean that if anybody is called at the TRRC just go there and tell the truth don't hide the truth you know they they seriously want people you know about about that and they also want people like if you are involved don't try to run away it's not a witch hunt they are mm -hmm. not after anybody you know just go there tell the truth about what you know because the country wants to know the truth and also uh, the, the, the the victims family want to know the truth also so that's the uh, the advice they, are, they have given to the even family. the person in himself you need to disburden yourselves and then perhaps that will be the beginning of atonement and will be forgiven. Thank you very much, gentlemen. We've come to the end of um, this week's TRRC Roundup. So we will just continue to advise, as, you know, the same way that the TRRC is advising everybody. Um, we need to go and confess. If you have something to confess, we need to go to disburden ourselves of, of, of this weight, perhaps has been inside us for, for, for nearly now 20, 25 years. And some of us listening, the, the, the testimony, some of which will enrage us, others perplex us, and, you know, and still others that would infuriate us. And yet, we must learn to keep our calm, keep our cool, and let processes take them their, 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 their pace. And we don't have to go out and revenge or do anything like that. Thank you very much. Hope to see you next week. <laughs>